All right. Recording is now in progress. Okay. It is now 7.01 p.m. Uh, this is the 8 December 2021 meeting of the Trail Sidewalks and Bikeways Committee. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA and the emergency ordinance, this committee needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It is a bit cumbersome, so I ask you in advance for your patience. First, because each member of the committee is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all of the other members. Accordingly, I'm going to ask, I'm going to conduct a roll call and ask each committee member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location for which you are participating. And I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues. Following this roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member. Uh, I am the representative at large and the chair of the committee. I am Ken Comer calling from my home in Springfield. Braddock District, Mr. Cosgrove. Uh, hello, this is Bob Cosgrove speaking from my home in Braddock District. Hunter Mill District, Mr. Rowe. Hello, Alex Rowe speaking from my home in Reston. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mountain Vernon District, Mr. Klein. Yeah, this is Jim Klein speaking from my home in Holland Hills. Thank you. The Draysville District, Mr. Smith. No response. Providence District is vacant unless there's somebody here from Providence District. Uh, Mason District, Mr. Albright. No response. Springfield District, Mr. Liebert. No response. Lee District, Mr. Pipkin. No response. Sully District, Ms. Ampe. This is Karen Ampe from my home in Oakton, Sully District. Thank you. Clifton Horse Society. Ms. McDaniel. This is Katie McDaniel calling from my home in Oak Hill. Thank you. Fairfax uh, Fab, uh, Mr. Newman. Good evening. This is Sean Newman calling from Springfield. Thank you. Uh, Fairfax Area Disability Services Board. I show it as vacant, but there may be somebody here. Is there anybody here from the board? No response. Fairfax County Federation of Citizens Associations, Mr. Tipton. Hi, this is Mark. I'm calling in from Rockville, Maryland. Am I taking notes tonight? I was told I was going to be. Well, uh, Beth, uh, as you'll discover shortly, is not going to be here. But So we would very much like you to take our, our minutes for tonight, uh, especially if that's what she arranged. Yes, I will do that. Thanks a lot, Ken. Thanks, I appreciate it, Mark. Uh, Fairfax County Park Authority, Ms. Ayanetta. No response. I'm told that she actually has to sign on saying they talk to her to the park board tonight. So during this meeting, so that's why she can't be here. Uh, Northern Virginia Builders Industry Association, Ms. Portia. No response. Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority is vacant unless there's somebody here from the Park Authority. Regional Park Authority. And Waba, Mr. Albers. Howard Albers from my home in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, thank you. That's the um, members of the committee. Uh, now, if I could ask the staff who are here tonight to uh, identify yourselves. Chris Wells, Fairfax County Department of Transportation. And Nicole Wynan, Fairfax County Department of Transportation. Okay, thanks. We'll get to the members of the public after we finish this. I move that each member's voice may be adequately heard by each other member of the committee 
It is our practice to approve this and all subsequent motions by acclamation. So I will ask now if there are any objections or nay votes. Hearing none, the motion carries. <clears throat> Second, having established that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that it compels it, these emergency procedures, the fact that we are meeting electronically, what type of electronic communication is being used, and how we have arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this committee to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. And as such, FOIA's unusual procedures, which require the physical assembly of this committee and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that this committee may conduct this meeting electronically through Cisco WebEx video conferencing platform. This format will also provide a dedicated phone line. The public may access this meeting by going to fairfax.webex.com and entering the event number 2339-391-7211 and the password uh, all tra uh, trails 2021 uh, capital T and uh, and no space or by calling 844-621-3956 uh, and using the access code 2339-391. 7211. It is so moved. I will again ask if there are any objections or nay votes. Hearing none, the motion carries. Finally, it is the next, it is next required to establish that all of the matters addressed in today's agenda address the emergency itself are necessary for the continuity in Fairfax County government and or are statute statutorily required or necessary to continue operations in the discharge of this committee's lawful purposes duties and responsibilities. It is so moved. I will again ask if there are any objections or nay votes. Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, now let me ask um, before we proceed with our business, are there any members of the public who are attending at this point? So we have five members of the public. Um, Four that are joining by computer and one um, person joining by phone. Okay, so let's um, let's have those folks identify themselves because we can get that on the recording. Uh, Great. All right. Um, so I will need to unmute and let's start with Philip. Hi, this is uh, Philip Latosa with uh, Friends of Accutane Creek, and I. Would like to uh, make a little presentation on the uh, Cinderbed Road Bikeway tonight. Understand. Um, okay. Next. Um, next, I'm going to unmute Gary. You're not unmuted. But we cannot hear you. Gary Banks. Right, I guess I will go on to the next person and try again afterwards. Um, let's go next to uh, the person on the phone calling in. I will unmute you. Uh, this is Wade Smith. Uh, I'm on the phone. I'm the Drangeville representative, but I can't use my computer tonight. All right, I will make you a panelist if I can. I'm not sure if I can because you have the phone. It doesn't give me the option. How does it usually handle, Ken? Um, I think uh, um, I think you'll just have to leave Wade unmuted, if you okay. will. Uh, that works. Since he's just by phone. Okay. Um, the next person I will unmute is uh, Betsy Martin. Hi, I'm Betsy Martin. I'm here for the Audubon Society of Northern Virginia. Thank you. And then we have Ira Garland. I will unmute you. Yes, thank you. I'm fr I'm from Friends of Acting Creek. I have a question. Thank you. Okay, we ju we're just asking the public to identify themselves. At eight thirty, we open the floor to the public. So so, um, and you'll be able to ask your question then. So. Um, and, and, and go ahead. We just had. Um, Gary 
posted something in the chat that he has sound issues. Here's in the Springfield in Springfield in the Lee District. So Gary, please uh, feel free to uh, enter any questions you have in the chat, um, and I'm happy to read them aloud. Nicole, what's Gary's last name again? Jump back to the list. Um, it's Gary Banks. Thank you. Sure. And that's all? That's all. Okay. Uh, now, you, if you display the, uh, the, the agenda, you will. Um, unfortunately, tonight we do not have minutes to approve from previous meetings. Uh, we're still collecting them and getting them together. Uh, and since our secretary uh, can't attend, uh, we expect to have the, the uh, several meetings for you to review, several minutes for you to review uh, uh, next month. So expect to see those come in the, in the mail um, over the over the coming month uh, as. Um, as it looks like I have, you should be looking at seeing July, September, November, and this month's meetings, December minutes uh, for approval on the, at the January meeting. Uh, so without that, next topic of the discussion is a staff uh, discussion of the Cinderbed Road Trail update. And I think, Chris, are you going to do that? Is that correct? Um, I can do it, but I don't have much of an update. So I wasn't, I, I didn't know exactly. I mean, we, we had the cinder bed. We had the Philip and, and Betsy, uh, I guess two months ago when I was here last. Um, I don't know if one of you, uh, committee members put this on the agenda and have a specific issue to discuss the, uh, the update I can tell you is, um, we, we are having a meeting, uh, next week. Um, the supervisor Lusk has um, organized with um, uh, Philip and, and the other um, folks who have expressed environmental concerns. Uh, we have some um, questions we're answering, you know, um, such as, you know, um, writing answers to how, how we've documented our environmental impacts, um, uh, the process for projects. Uh, Getting approved, uh, how groups uh, such as them can stay uh, better informed, which I acknowledge is a tough thing to do in this county with a lot going on. So, um, things like that. So, we're preparing uh, a, a document that will be distributed early next week by the engineer for the project, Jeff Faseshi, uh, and then we'll have this meeting next week. Um, the alignment, the project has essentially, um, from that scale, remain unchanged. What has uh, been uh, looked at is, are there some engineering techniques that we can do to um, mitigate the impacts to the um, environment from the project? And so, in consultation with the uh, stormwater folks and the park authority folks, we have some uh, innovative uh, engineering techniques uh, that uh, we're ready to apply to the project. Um, but that's that's essentially uh, where things stand now. I think we'll have um, a lot uh, better um, guidance on where where we're going with this uh, after we meet. Uh, and then uh, it's possible we have like another public meeting to um, take this back to the public and um, explain the changes that have been made uh, to help uh, with some of the concerns. Um, let me ask you this: we, Do you have a proposed alignment already? Yes, there's a there's an alignment. Um, I don't have it with me. But you uh, made that you made that public, right? Yeah. Yeah, we had a we had a public meeting, a citizens information meeting. I think it was in May. It was earlier this year, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, when the project was conceived, um, it was you know more of a straight line towards the Franconia 
uh, metro station, but uh, that in, that was going through private property through uh, right through the middle of people's private property, not not along one of the edges, uh, and so uh, that was determined not to be realistic, and so we were looking at how to align ourselves along along the uh, railroad track corridor, the uh, say, uh, service um, uh, uh, maintenance um, trail, access road, <laughs> I wouldn't call it a road, four wheel drive trail, um, and how, how we would be able to approach the Frank Benny Metro station utilizing some of that. But that did necess necessitate uh, crossing the creek um, and then uh, moving through a, a wetlands area. So that that's the, I think the uh, area of most concern of the uh, of the of the environmental concerns. And you 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 have what is roughly the timeline? Um, we're at final design or a hundred you know a hundred percent design. So this has been going. Uh, this has had design work going on for a few years at this point. So it's uh, fairly advanced in the process. Um, we, the public meeting was, was brought forth when it was probably, you know, um, 70% design. So, the, uh, uh, final design will be our next, uh, milestone. So then, uh, after final design would be, uh, the utilities and the right of way, uh, phase, uh, and then ultimately construction. So I don't know the, uh, the date that is published. If there is a date published for construction, typically the, uh, Utilities and right of way phase uh, last uh, a year, 18 months. Um, so this would still be, you know, a couple of years into the future for construction. Okay. And the, uh, the, the, the once final design is set, um, um, I mean, that's final means final, right? It's, it's, that's going to be the alignment. That's going to be the configuration of the trail in terms of surface and uh, and uh, and the like. Is that correct? Generally speaking, yes. Um, I, um, I forgot to mention lighting. We're also um, lighting this trail, uh, and again, some of the concerns have been the lighting. So we've uh, looked at the um, the temperature, the uh, the temperature of the light. Temperature of the bulbs, maybe I should say, uh, and how that, what kind of light that that casts. Uh, but you know, sometimes there are um, uh, minor changes to the project in because of the utilities and the right of way acquisition phase. That uh, say something uh, uh, happens where the utilities can't move exactly the way you would hope. Then there might be a, a minor um, tweak shifting to the design. Uh, likewise, in the right of way negotiation. Uh, process if if something some, something comes up that uh, needs to be addressed uh, there are always uh, potentials changes to the design because of those processes but generally speaking the alignment uh, and the design uh, would be set after after this next uh, stage. Oh, yeah, this is Jim Klein. I did have a couple questions for you. Um, sure. What is the status of the any NEPA documentation? This was a rec trail project, correct? Funded through federal money. Sure. So that uh, that question we had a previous meeting, and uh, the this is federally funded, so it has to have um, uh, the NEPA documentation. But uh, if I'm I'm not I'm not a <laughs> the uh the NEPA guy but the way I understand it is that um we have a uh trails are considered something that gets a categorical exclusion in Virginia and so we provide the documentation for the categorical exclusion. Um that's not to say we don't make efforts to use engineering techniques to mitigate the uh the issues. As part of that, we do do um, require documentation for endangered species or other uh, federal requirements, but uh, that 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 has been completed, and 
um, I believe uh, the engineer Jeff had has made that available uh, to the to the public. I, I don't know if that's on our website or if we were distributing it separately. So, so VDOT signed off on this environmental document and approved it. Yes, this has been this has been approved for a while now. Okay, and was there any wetlands that were delineated and flagged and marked in the field and uh, avoided, or any wetland permitting that was required? I'm not aware of any permitting, but yes, there there's certainly wetlands here, and that's that's the issue. And, and Philip uh, can explain it better than me. It's a East Coast Magnolia Bog, something like that, that is uh, unique in the way the groundwater seepage happens um, through the ground, not um, like the common wetlands where uh, water uh, is on the surface. So the, the, the area nearest or as we approach the station, uh, the project's a, it's a very long project. It, it, it extends from the, the dead end of Cinderbed Road down by our, our transit uh, facilities all the way up to the Franconia Station. As it, as it gets close to the Franconia Station, it crosses the stream valley. Um, so yes, we, we delineated the, the, the wetlands, the um, resource protection area. Um, we uh, purposely designed our bridge. There's a fairly uh, large and expensive bridge structure um, crossing the floodplain. We designed it to not only cross generally perpendicular, but to actually angle the piers slightly. So typically, you know, a bridge is this way and the piers are at 90 degrees. We're actually angling the piers um, about 15 degrees off of 90 or something like that to match the, the stream flow of the of the of the that of the floodplain when it floods. So um, to answer your question, yes, uh, we, we, we certainly identified that and have, have done um, what we what we had previously done, what we thought we could. But again, as I said, in consultation with stormwater and um, parks, uh, we have a couple other engineering techniques that we think can help with the uh, the groundwater seepage under where the trail is not on the bridge, where it's on the ground. Okay, and as part of the NEPA documentation, was there, I'm sorry, what was my last question, I promise. The, was there a sort of public, if I understand a categorical exclusion, if there's enough public interest in an environmental issue that that can up the level of the environmental documentation, but VDOT did not feel that that was necessary for this project? I, I don't, I'm not uh, intimate with that answer to that question i did hear in a previous meeting the term posting of willingness so it's possible that we did a posting of willingness for that and did not receive a response a posting of willingness is um, a term uh, in in the in vdot uh, for um, making an opportunity for a public meeting and if no one requests it then a public meeting is not required but i i don't want to misspeak and say that that uh, definitely happened associated with the NEPA process. I, I just, um, I heard that phrase used in a meeting and since, um, since we had our own uh, public meeting on the project, which we did have, um, that in my mind, that, that seems to indicate that that might have been what happened uh, with, the, with the public aspect of the NEPA process. But I okay. don't know for sure. All right. Thank, thanks so much. That's good question? information. Mm -hmm. This is James. Um, so I was kind of stunned. I didn't realize that it went through a magnolia bog. That's a pretty significantly special environment. Arlington County sets them aside very carefully. There are very, very few left. Um, and I'm it's remarkable to me that they would that we're allowing the trail to go directly through that. Um, is there potential for additional mitigation? Well, that what we're looking at is additional mitigation. Uh, a way, there's a, a an engineering technique called a French drain that is essentially a concrete structure with uh, a crisscross um, webbing channeling that allows the groundwater to flow through. So that 
that is the additional mitigation that we're, we're looking at. Um, but yes, that's the, that is the concern uh, that has been brought to our attention. Uh, it's not a, it's not a federally mandated uh, thing that, uh, that is clear, clear cut that would have been um, um, a, a fatal flaw. So it, 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 it leaves us in a gray area where we, we recognize that this is important, um, but the, the NEPA process, the federal funding or anything, nor the, nor the Virginia environmental process um, have a requirement about what to do here. So uh, that's, that's where we find ourselves. Well, I mean, that's, that's, a, a, I mean, I understand the challenge and regardless of whether the federal or the state laws are requiring that, um, those are really significant sites. It's not just like, wow, it's a wetland that we're going to mitigate. I mean, those are significant and there are very, very few of them left in, in, in the country. So, um, I would be interested to see what additional approaches we take. If there is any time for that, um, it, it is concerning to me that that would not that we have any right to. Push back on that, but it's concerning to me that we're considering putting this trail through a bog, um, specifically a magnolia bog, which is again a unique environmental feature. We spent a whole bunch of time. We gave up a trail that went through Huntley Meadows, which didn't have any of these. You know, it was like they liked it that way, and that's they wanted to keep it that way. This is actually a significant environmental resource, so um, that's that's of a concern. I'll, I'll leave it there. Any other members have questions? Let me um, let me ask question, Chris about the other side of the equation. Um, what uh, is, is there a trail there now? There a, a, a sort of a, a, some sort of walk hiking trail or something like that? Is that right? There, there's parts of it, not not in this area of of the environmental. Uh, contentions. Um, there's um, a development uh, s uh, south of there, so sort of like in the middle of the wooded section of this trail, you know, sort of in the middle of the end of Cinderbed Road and Franconia Springfield Metro. Uh, there is a section that was built by a developer. It's the, like sort of the back of their property. Uh, and I believe there's a section that's also on Park Authority property that was built. Uh, but no, where um, between Cinderbed and that middle section, and between the middle section and the Franconia Springfield Metro, uh, there is no um, human trail that I'm aware of. I'm, I, it's possible there's a an informal trail, but there's certainly not uh, any. Uh, one of the thing, it, one it, of the things that we're talking about there's not any there's not a sewer line or something like that. One of the things that has particularly concerned about the Huntley Meadows loss of the trail from the master plan was that there were not a lot of other transportation alternatives. There still aren't uh, that that uh, that traverse that area. Um, uh, are there other transportation alternatives for non-vehicular transportation, both hikers, joggers, cyclists, certainly? Bikeways. Is there another bikeway? Um, yes. Um, there. Is the, so the purpose of this project is to make a direct connection to the metro station and a, uh, at the at the northern end, and a direct connection to the uh, Fairfax County Parkway Trail uh, at the southern end, um, which allows access to Fort Belvoir, and. Um, We've long had complaints about how people get to the south side of the Franconia Metro station. Uh, uh, Barry, Barry Road is the road that leads up to the back side of that station. It doesn't have any sidewalks. It's a, it's a narrow road. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, uh, there are two roads that generally parallel this route. Uh, there's to the east, there's Beulah, uh, I guess that's street. Um, and to the west, there's Lowestdale Road. So uh, Beulah has on-road bike lanes and sidewalks. Uh, Lowestdale uh, has a trail. So from 
from the aspect of connecting um, the Fair Fairfax County Parkway or Fort Belvoir to the station. Those alternative routes exist. They're not um, as direct. They're not as um, continuous. You know, you know how the condition, the conditions of our trails, or how things have been built. There's a uh, you know discontinuity. It's, it's not a continuous shared use path for for bicyclists, uh, but um, those do exist. Um, but however, for the communities that you know are adjacent to these properties, um, there's not a there's not a, um, a connection that would be equivalent to this today. There are ways to that, that connect the neighborhood. There is a um, a trail that connects uh, Barry Road to, I believe, the Amberley neighborhood. So there there are um, there are alternative routes. And I assume this is on the master plan, is that correct? Yes, this is in the this was in the bicycle master plan and uh, this was a project that went uh, that was approved in the transportation priorities plan. So it was in the, the county dialogue on transportation in, in the year 2013 and then approved. Uh, in the transportation priorities plan in 2014. And then the bicycle master plan came after that. Uh, that was 2015 or 16. And so it was incorporated into the bicycle master plan at that point. Uh, this is Jim again. You know, one of the challenges we have is that most of our trail corridors are in stream valley like this or near this. Uh, so I guess we need to find a way to kind of um, ensure the two things can coexist. I think they can. I think that's maybe what Ken is getting at. We need the trail. We need the bog. You know, can't we have both? You know, so I guess that's what I'm wanting. Why well, I want to kind of get to the facts of the bog and the fact, you know, where is the trail related to the bog? What is the drainage doing around it? Why can't both of these things coexist in in, uh, in a positive way? You know, I'm hoping that's what you're heading forward and, and uh, toward. I don't know the, the way you describe the French drain doesn't sound like it's really going to do it, but maybe I don't know. Uh, so I, I guess I'm just making a comment here that we we can't just let this go as a don't build the trail or or you know or not. It just build the trail in a way that makes it. The bog work, or it makes the transportation work, or the, the route work, you know, in a more continuous way. So I guess I'm just editorializing. Well, no, it's a good point. I mean, we, as you, as you say, you know, stream valleys are uh, in the park authority. Stream valleys is is uh, often where they they build trails, and they uh, those are trails are the park authority's most popular thing with um, residents, um, and it's not. In those, in most many of their cases, or most of their cases, it's not for transportation purposes. It's for enjoyment of nature. It's for people to get out and and be able to relax, and you know, uh, um, no matter their um, socioeconomic background, um, they can escape you know, the real world and get in, <laughs> the human world, the built environment, and and enjoy nature and enjoy the. Uh, the, the positives of nature. Of course, that has educational benefits that, you know, the, the next generation um, to be stewards of the environment uh, need to learn and be exposed to the environment um, to be that next generation to look out for it. So there's absolutely um, benefits uh, beyond transportation in, in stream valley trails and, and, and uh, what we're doing. But as as is um, being discussed now about this project, you know, um, is it possible to uh, achieve both, uh, and if so, how? Well, just as a, as a as a thought, and um, I'm uh, I guess. 
there's disconnects along the road network and disconnects along the alternatives such that um, such that this this more direct route is much more attractive um, to get between two disconnected parts of the county. That's that's happening all over the county. Um, so so um, it's 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 we're desperate to preserve this this type of connectivity. That's one of the reasons why we have this committee is to is to rather than have this this confetti of disconnected trails, we actually have a network. So this sounds like a, a, um, something that would be built as part of a network. Uh, but uh, in terms of cost benefit analysis, I would wonder if you took a look at if you look at the expense of the mitigation. Uh, would it be cheaper to um, to make the the to put sidewalks in along the roads that don't have sidewalks, for example, or I'm sorry, side paths uh, and the like along the roads that don't have side paths um, uh, and achieve the same the same goal, provided of course the connectivity is all the way. Uh, I guess there's a railroad out there and there's a stream. I mean, uh, so so. Uh, I wouldn't want to build a trail to nowhere and say, look, we've got 90% of your connectivity. You just can't make this connection. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. Something that would be a true replacement uh, that might, uh, might be, be cheaper, perhaps not as pleasant, but I understand the, uh, understand the advantages of a unique bog. Um, uh, I would want to be sure that not if you looked at it, not every bog that we have in Fairfax County, every wetland we have in Fairfax County is unique, because so otherwise we talk ourselves out of out of out of building even what we have right now, which is which is um, uh, heavily appreciated by the public. Let's put it this way: if you took away what we have right now in stream valleys, the public would scream. Uh, they use it extent so so extensively. So so uh, so. Um, yeah, I just hope that uh, that uh, we can find a good compromise between the between between what might be a delicate environmental situation uh, and uh, and uh, and the the need to create a a transportation network as opposed to um, just a just a few recreational trails. Um, uh, you know that that. Uh, 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 for the folks in that part of the county that that that, that, uh, that would want to get out on a cycle bicycle, want to get out on a, uh, or or everything else you see wandering around the, the Cross County Trail, the, the uh, um, uh, increasing number of vehicles you see in the Cross County Trail. Um, so there you go. I I can editorialize along with uh, along with Jim Klein. Well, we're going to hear from the public at eight thirty, and uh, and uh, I'm sure they've they've. They get a lot to, to to talk about. So, any other issue? Yeah. Uh, here? Uh, the the one other thing I would mention, and it, you made me think of it when uh, you, you said something there about the the connectivity of the network. Of course, the the on street routes, the Lois Dale and Beulah, well, those have <laughs> cars. They have side streets. So, you know, even though there might be the physical connectivity, um, the ability to um, to move along those corridors. Um, Again, it's not it's not necessarily the uh, the uh, the um, attractiveness of, of 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 a wooded environment, but it's the fact that that's still a car dominated environment out there on Lois Dale and and Beulah. So um, you would have safety risks and um, delay and um, less enjoyment uh, than a direct route. So that's that's certainly one other. Uh, reason that the stream valley trails, as you mentioned, are are very attractive to people because they they don't have those those conflicts with vehicles. Reducing conflicts with vehicles is is the the modern design goal of of cycling networks um, across the U.S. It's that's the that's we've commented many times. That's the that is the. Uh, um, uh, Essential that there's the emergent realization is that we have to keep bicycles separated from cars. Uh, this has not always been the case, and uh, and it is now sort of sort of the the matter of public policy. So so uh, and this this so I'm hoping I'm hopeful that you'll find a, a, a compromise that 
that can can realize that. Uh, we've learned from, quite frankly, deadly um, uh, 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 results. That uh, that that's that's we're not just making that up just to be just to be pleasant. That uh, that we have to. Uh, Europe learned it, you know, decades before we did. But we have to separate them if we're going to move larger numbers of cycling traffic uh, uh, across networks. So, um, yeah. Uh, any other comments on the uh, comments from the committee on the on the uh, on the trail report, on this trail report? Uh, so um, this is this is Sean Newman. Oops, sorry. Go ahead, Sean. All right. So this go is ahead, Sean, Sean Newman from Tab. Um, so just a, a mainly a general comment right now, which is that um, we need to learn how to take space from vehicles, from cars, for bike trails. I understand that there are times when we will want to, um, you know, put a trail through a new trail through a uh, natural area, and that can be okay. And but I think we really need to prioritize building separated bike infrastructure where there is currently car infrastructure. If we are going to get away from being a car dominant county, we have to get away from being having all of our infrastructure dominated by cars. Um, Chris, could I just ask for your opinion as to whether you think the the wetlands mitigation is adequate and whether you think the removal of trees for the trail is excessive or appropriate? Could you just give me your opinion? Uh, I, on the on the tree issue, um, you know, the park authority has taught us over the years that uh, um, Stream Valley trails or, or trails through parks are very compatible because even though there is uh, tree loss, the forest canopy will close back in over over five years or so, and um, it'll it'll you know essentially revert to the same forested environment that that was there before. Um, I, I cannot honestly speak to the. Uh, to the environmental issue of of the wetlands, that is that's an area that is not my expertise, and I've only I've only just begun to sit in on a couple of these meetings and hear the people who who are more expert on this talk. So I I really um, I really can't um, honestly uh, um, professionally answer answer that question because it's beyond my professional um, expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I'm just taking some notes here. This is Bob. Who asked that last question? Was it Alex? Mark. Tipton. Mark. I thought it was Mark. Just ask everybody in the committee when you speak, say who you are because we're all virtual and, you know, it, it really helps because we can't fingerprint every voice necessarily. Thank you. Hey, this is Sean again. Um, I just wanted to ask, what is the current decision point on this trail? What is the what? What is the what is the current decision point? I'll just leave it at that. Um, I believe the the answer is Supervisor Lusk has um, taken this issue seriously and has um, uh, again convened one meeting previously and has an upcoming meeting. Uh, uh, convened so i i don't i don't think a decision has been made yet uh, nor uh, am i aware of what the what the ultimate process will be to, to make a decision um but he he has taken this issue seriously and has certainly made an effort to get staff to uh, um, you know be transparent and and provide answers to the questions that are being asked of us Chris, I, I, I keep thinking about the Mount Vernon Trail where, where it goes over some marshes and uh, it has a, it has a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, a boardwalk. 
that goes over the marshes. Um, is that no longer part of the design standards? I, that question was asked in, in the last meeting because that's the obvious <laughs> layman's question. You know, oh, can't, can't you build a boardwalk? And I don't recall uh, the answer to that. Uh, I, um, those are, you know, they're, they're more expensive, but certainly in our, in our Huntley Meadows discussion, that was one of the uh, uh, engineering uh, toolkit issues uh, that we considered. Um, so I, it, it might have had something to do with the construction of the, the main bridge because it, it needs to get in there to construct the main bridge. So it's possible that the, uh, the at grade facility is needed um, for the main bridge to be constructed, but I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't recall exactly uh, what the resolution was of of the boardwalk question, and so that's that, that is a good question. Is there a way to um, even after you know construction activity leave a finished product such as a boardwalk that again would allow nature to um, to do what nature needs to do? Uh, this is Jim Klein again. Just to uh, Add into that discussion, you can build a boardwalk from the boardwalk. So it's a basically called a top down construction where the equipment drives over and you can build bridges that way too, uh, depending on where the bridge is. Uh, so that you can just use it basically a bobcat size piece of equipment uh, that drives the piles in from above and keeps. Um, sorry, keeps. Uh, I was going to use my hands. <laughs> So it, it basically drives the piles down from above and then you build the next section and the next section after that. So, and there's literally, I mean, the only impact to a wetland would be the person, the place where they drive the piles, a uh, little bit of the light that, you know, that doesn't get through the boardwalk area. And then also the uh, people walking along the, the uh, area where they're going to guide the pile driving. That's it. So, I mean, that I, seems like a good solution to me. Yeah, I mean, any disturbance is, is is a disturbance, but I would not want the the, the best to be the enemy of the good. You know, uh, uh, we're we're com we're balancing two needs, both are legitimate needs. The purpose of this committee is to is to sort of sort of um, advocate for for a network, uh, and uh, and and it would be. Uh, we'd be remiss if we weren't in our duties, if we were not trying to at least um, maintain the value of something that's, that is, has been approved on the master plan, uh, put on the master plan for a reason. So, so, uh, so I would encourage you to come up with a good answer for why we couldn't do something like a boardwalk or something like that. Uh, I, I, I just sent an email real quick to the engineers asking that question. Hey, what what happened to the what was the answer to that question? So uh, to remind us of that question. Thank you. Hey, Chris, this is Sean again. Is it possible to get a some, a briefing from uh, the engineer or somebody who is, you know, has a higher level of knowledge about the, the boardwalk, the impact to the uh, the construction and ongoing impacts to the wetlands, et cetera? Um, the uh, uh, easy answer might be yes, except again, I'm not sure that um, our engineer uh, ha has the this the, some of the knowledge that even some of you all do of, about how how things are built through uh, like the 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 um, the Prince William part of the Potomac National Heritage Trail. So uh, this we've again we've approached this in, in our um, in in the way that we approach projects and the legal uh, requirements of us. Now that this issue has been brought to our attention, uh, we're um, gaining new knowledge uh, by uh, special. Uh, Folks with specialty uh, uh, knowledge. So, um, certainly we can we can ask the the engineer to come give a, a presentation. But I think 
uh, it's probably not. I don't think we've we've reached all those conclusions yet to know uh, what the best engineering solutions are. Well, I guess so. I guess I'm not necessarily thinking of the best engineering solutions, but also of so they they have a current engineering solution that they have designed, and they have a current plan to implement that design. And it would be nice to be able to ask them to you know to get a real good idea of how those. How they think that those what what is currently designed, not the ideal, not not these, you know. They have designed this as a post to a boardwalk for a reason, I'm sure, and it would be good to be able to get an understanding of what that reason is and what the impacts will be. Sure, well, uh, we can, we can follow up and, and ask them to come uh, make a presentation. So, Chris, that would be great. Thank you. Chris, when you have a situation like this where you have an environmental feature that you admittedly are, you know, it's, it's relatively new, that is significant, what do you do if you want to bring in additional information to address that? I mean, I agree with what Sean said. There's an engineering approach we've already identified. I realize this is late to the game, but still, you know, how do you access information that is critical for an investigation like this? I mean, um, you know, it's, so, it's, go ahead. Yeah, the, so there's an engineering, so even though our engineer on staff, Jeff, um, is the project manager for it, there's a consultant that is really uh, doing the, the design work on this. And I don't remember which firm is, is the consultant, but in this last meeting, uh, they actually brought in uh, what their expert from one of their offices, North Carolina, Richmond, something like that. Where where he is he is their company's expert on on this issue, and so you know we were we were being given um, expert advice on on uh, some of these techniques that have been used throughout the country to try and address things like this. So uh, I don't I didn't mean to make it sound as if <laughs> we're we're just a bunch of dumb Fairfax County guys that, that don't know what we're doing. We you know we pay these firms and. When things like this come up, they can also reach out to sub consultants and and get uh, even, you know. The best advice in the United States as part of their. Their uh, contractual consultants. So, um, you know, again, that this we, we, uh, we appreciate the, this concern being brought to our attention and we're, uh, we're, we're, um, you know, doing, doing the due diligence that we can to try and. Uh, get the answers. I'm just not. I I don't think I'm the person to to speak <laughs> intelligently about this, and I'm not sure uh, the our engineer Jeff is either. He if if uh, when we invite him to come make uh, a presentation, uh, I would suggest that he uh, bring uh, the environmental expert from his civil in, the, the consulting firm that's designing this project for us to be able to uh, uh, get into these issues uh, in depth. Thank you. I'd love to do that. I would also really like that. They, that would be great, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Somebody else, perhaps? Okay, good enough. Um, we're going to probably return to this by uh, when we go to the public at 8:30. But uh, but uh, let's uh, let's move through the rest of the agenda here. Um, staff report. Uh, and that would be, I think, Nicole. Well, I wanted to um, jump in on the active Fairfax, but if you want to do the uh, the infrastructure investment jobs act, I don't know if Chris wants to speak to that as well. Yeah, why don't you go first so I can catch my breath and then uh, I'll come back to that. Let's give Chris a little break. <laughs> um, so, on, uh, so jumping to the active Fairfax update, um, we are wrapping up phase one at this point. So we are um, in the final stages of the uh, safe streets for all recommendations, uh, public outreach. So um, the uh, public comment period is still open until the 10th um, Friday. 
So we have um, hosted two public meetings, which were well attended and we had great conversations and positive feedback overall. Um, there were some, you know, uh, understandable concerns about funding. Um, uh, some of the, the recommendations as well as um, a VDOT buy in, which will be necessary. Um, but overall, uh, the um, recommendations were well received and uh, I don't foresee um, um, a lot of changes uh, as they are now. We also um, met with uh, small groups um, with opportunity neighborhood residents um, and the meetings was hosted bilingually in English and Spanish and that was well attended um, and that was in partnership with neighborhood community services. Um, and there were some really great conversations there and and 1 topic really that stood out. Um, that wasn't previously covered in our recommendations was. Uh, the need to uh, improve personal safety. Uh, in in certain areas of the county where that could be. A problem um, through lighting primarily, so there was a, a general request to have areas with higher crime rates. Lit in order to provide more uh, personal safety and comfort um, on our active transportation infrastructure. We also met with uh, a stakeholder group. Um, I think you all were invited to that as well. So uh, that was a um, invitation uh, only meeting, so not a public meeting, um, with uh, dozens of uh, groups were invited, both from the, um, uh, of course, the active transportation um, interests, but also our uh, from our list of community assets that the county has developed as part of the COVID outreach. Um, so they have a great resource for, for us to use to um, contact information to community organizations that um, have a, um, a relationship with, with uh, citizens residents of, of need. Um, so that includes houses of worship, of course, organizations that specialize in um, catering to the needs of um, um, certain populations such as immigrants. So there, there's a great way of um, reaching a, a different perspective um, than who we reach in our public meetings. And that was um, also well attended meeting and very informative discussions. So uh, we are planning on making final updates uh, to uh, the next draft of the recommendations for the Safe Streets for Our program um, and bring that to the Board Transportation Committee on February 1st um, for discussion and then uh, incorporate the feedback uh, we receive and then bring it to the full board for approval um, in early spring. And just to... Um, Clarify the, the approval would just be of uh, the general concept of the program. It wouldn't approve staff positions that will be needed um, to run the program um, or the funding, which would also need to be separately approved. Um, and that would be something we would pursue separately outside the active Fairfax um, program once um, the board approves the concept. Um, and as you know, Lauren Delmar is our lead currently. And she gave uh, the presentations, so I'm speaking for her <laughs> tonight uh, about this, but um, we are um, basically in the final stages of, of that. Also, one of the other um, tasks that we added at the end of phase one was um, another look at the equity analysis, equity need analysis that we had previously developed earlier in phase one uh, to refine it a little bit more. There were some concerns about <coughs> Um, potentially double counting and showing areas as in need that really were not um, known as uh, equity need areas. So the consultant is, is currently working on um, refining the analysis, providing three, um, three versions, three different methodologies um, to, to get a, us a better result because it's really important that we get, that we identify the areas in need correctly. Um, and I should define that the area needs both include, um, it's actually two separate needs. One need is to, um, of course, it's the economic need uh, for active transportation out of necessity uh, because 
you know, they, they don't have access to a car, can't afford a car, rely on transit. So that's a, a, a very real transportation need to, to get to uh, daily destinations, work, school, the hospital, the grocery store. But then we also um, have a need to identify areas where we culturally don't hear from. So that could include all sorts of economic backgrounds, um, including, and there's an overlap of course with uh, the economic need, but then there's also areas that um, have uh, higher numbers of um, you know, um, diversity that may not, um, you know, th those are not the people necessarily that come to our meetings that we hear from that call the supervisors for cultural reasons. It's just not something that is happening in the culture. I'm from a culture like that. So that is an adjustment for me to, to have, you know, call the government and ask for something that's not really done in other countries necessarily. Um, either because there is respect that the, the government would do the right thing or because the government wouldn't respond anyway. Um, so, acknowledging that there is this cultural barrier to participation in, in the transportation planning process and also the funding process, um, we want to identify those areas so we can do targeted outreach um, or take a closer look at gaps that we may not know about because nobody told us about those gaps. So, that's the analysis we're working on and that will wrap up phase one. And then phase two, um, we were funded, of course, as you know. So we're working on the scope. Uh, it's currently being refined. Um, we have a pretty uh, pretty final scope at this point, but are in um, negotiations just about the contract. So we are looking probably at a um, early 2022 start date. So once we wrap up phase two, we should be able to seamlessly launch into phase. Uh, once we wrap up phase one, we should be seamlessly be able to launch into phase two at this point. And then we're looking at about 18 months schedule. So if all works well, um, we're looking at a uh, summer 2023 um, final product of the active Fairfax transportation plan. Do you have any specific questions about what we're working on? And just looking in the chat, I saw some chats come in. Nicole, this is Beth. Okay. Hopefully mm -hmm. you can hear me. <laughs> yes, I can. Winging it. Yeah. I'm winging it here at the office tonight since I was at the Park Authority board meeting. Um, do you have any sort of like rough idea of some of the, the, the scope refinements you're talking about for phase two? Just kind of a broad, broad brush. Nothing specific, I guess. Just trying to get an idea of what may have changed. I know you moved Safe Streets for All up into phase mm -hmm. one, but were there anything else change-wise? It, the scope that we uh, originally um, planned for before we launched the phase one is quintessentially still the same. Um, the, we had to make some adjustments to fit it into the budget because what we didn't, didn't have at that point was the outreach and the intensity of the outreach we're currently doing and then the complication through COVID. So we are setting a lot more money aside for outreach than we originally planned, which makes us um, a little bit tighter in other areas, but we don't want to compromise on um, the product we can deliver. So we basically have to take on more as staff. So that's what we're negotiating um, down to the last dollar where we can have um, staff resources um, to, in order to um, release some funding for other um, consultant-led efforts that staff cannot produce. Then the only other thing I was wondering about, and you might not know the answer, which is fine, um, but to try to um, get an understanding of how much time we're budgeting for to review the large amount of recommendations that came in and how that's going to get tackled <laughs> would be great to know. You might not have an answer today, but it's hot on the you know topics here of staff time for evaluating the the recommendations. So. So we could start now. I uh, um, it's great timing you asked. I just got the GS data this morning <laughs> of uh, what we currently received uh, from the um, public feedback maps. 
My concern is that these maps are still open and we're actually going to have another round of outreach in the spring where we will actually go in person to communities with paper maps and pen and pencil basically to, to have them drawn maps. So the, the only outreach we did with currently was um, online. And we know it's it's not that many people that participated. We have a, we have tons of uh, feedback, um, but it's a certain demographic again that that provided that feedback. So we we want to add more to the map uh, by by having more um, um, outreach in the spring. So I don't want you to go through the whole list and then it will be hard to determine which one you have already reviewed. So we may need to uh, wait until we close the map. Um, and then we will have uh, a, a work, working committee that will probably lead, need a lot of time to, to work through this. And Stormwater has reached out. They are interested in, in helping with the same review from their perspective to make sure that we don't plan a trail through Magnolia Bog or you know, another um, environmental resource that we should know about. Um, I mean, many are flagged in, in GIS, but maybe not all. Uh, so having uh, a very thorough review uh, by by parks and and stormwater and other um, providers that that have that expertise uh, would be helpful, but we may have to to wait a little bit. But we certainly will take the time that we need. That's great. Yeah. So Park Authority will have to probably put together a team of people of experts that we have to start evaluating some of this stuff. And I will just add that um, stormwater and and park staff for trails have been having some early conversations about um, some how to make smarter decisions in our sensitive environmental areas like the parks and the stream valleys and how to make the trails uh, more resilient. So, and um, yeah, so we kind of started that conversation ahead of doing the work, but we're trying to get a, a jump on those conversations so we're not doing it <laughs> slammed at the end. So uh, yeah, just keep us posted because it's going to be probably a robust conversation. Yeah, that's great. And and please keep me in the loop and some of those discussions as well, uh, particularly if you have, uh, for example, a evaluation sheet, like what methodology are you using to look at to look at the trails? Um, that's something that that you're developing. Uh, that you have already, or you're refining specific to what type of trail it is, um, because we also are going to develop a, a facility selection toolkit as as um, either in parallel to the map. Potentially, when we're doing the outreach, uh, we're using the time to work on the facility selection toolkit. Um, and it's um, <coughs> just for roads. And that was one thing we refined of the scope that wasn't in the original scope, but in the new scope, it actually is for trails as well. So we can pick the correct trail surface type um, potentially need for, for a boardwalk um, and have that option in the, in the master plan. Or at least in the toolkit, um, uh, informing the the network. What does more resilient mean? So more resilient is um, when you have a trail that uh, constantly gets flooded and is undermined by more water events, flooding, drainage problems. A lot of work goes into trying to locate trails in the best possible location to avoid that. And this is really speaking more towards a natural surface trail. Because we have so many trails in, you know, RPAs and in the stream valleys, the water events are getting worse. And to try to manage that, um, we try to make the best decisions as possible. Sometimes we have constraints from the amount of land we have to fit something <laughs> in. There's, you know, grade, steep grades in the county. We have kind of a mixed bag. And so having a trail be more resilient means it's able to withstand, you know, it's placed in the right location. You're not constantly having to replace the trail. I know I-495 has like mud slung across it all the time because the water comes over and just drops, you know, mud across it. And then the park ops people have to go out and scrape it off. Like we're trying to learn from those and make better more informed decisions since we are going to probably have more trails in wet areas because we have more wet areas. Thanks. I was just curious about. So Beth, let, let me ask you the GS data that we have, how um, up to date is that? It sounds like there's a changing environment um, 
wetlands potentially increasing in size? Is that what you're saying? Like what? No, it's, just, it's really more just more drainage. You know, more more sheet flow of water coming across trails. There, there's. Um, I mean, you can look at any stream valley in the county, and you can just see how the the edges of it have just um, worn away into steep banks by the sheer volume of water that is coming through, because rain events are just bigger and more frequent, and the, a lot of the trails that we have become impassable. They're not usable. Um, they become wider and create more damage because people try to walk around the wet parts of the trail, which, you know, the, we're trying to make more informed decisions. A lot of wetlands are, um, get, get divided by trails. So you, you don't have that, I'm sure you guys already talked about Cinder Bend Road, where um, you're trying to maintain those areas and not disrupt them by having a, a raised, you know, path through them and bisecting them, all those kinds of things. It's a, it's a, it's a large, it's a large bag <laughs> to try to, to, to sort through. But um, so stormwater planning and, and, and park road trails are trying to have some thing, you know, lessons that we've learned and things we're trying to do better. Whereas like, we don't quite have the PFM guidance to give us that. We just know already what we're, we, should, we could be avoiding and trying to not replicate mistakes of the past that we know are not going to be good for the future so it's great and and we do have those on, on the transportation side as well we have still a lot of soft surface trails uh in our um uh, vdot right away transportation network which are no longer something we would uh construct or maintain so those will need to have uh, an updated surface recommendation as well Okay, thank you guys. Um, so with that, uh, looking at the clock, uh, we got a, uh, about 15 minutes. Uh, Nicole, did you have anything else? I assume not. Just uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I did. I have a couple of things I'd like to uh, talk to the committee about uh, on under staff reports um, that is not on the agenda here. Uh, the one question I have for the committee, and it's a uh, um, something that you can get back to David and I separately. I understand that you had an interest in having uh, Deputy County Executive Rachel Flynn uh, come back to the committee. And the question I had, and I, I apologize if it didn't get back to you all for this month, was um, is there a subject matter? Is there an issue that, that you uh, would like her to present on or um, uh, uh, you know, she she gave her presentation previously on uh, the the placemaking and the the uh, importance of the work that we all share uh, as the county moves forward. But um, I I didn't understand if if it was just a general invitation uh, for uh, Rachel to come back, or if there was something in particular that you'd like uh, uh, her to to discuss. Um, I, I I wouldn't want um, some of these outstanding issues, like the route 1 speed limit or something, uh, to be something that we would, you know, put on her shoulders, because that's something that staff is working on. So I just throw that out there. Please, uh, separately, uh, communicate with, uh, David and I on what, you, what you're looking for there. Um, the infrastructure act, let me, let me, uh, talk about that quickly. And then, uh, I do have. Actually, one very important thing, and then two uh, things of interest to the committee. So, the Infrastructure Act, I was uh, reached out to my uh, legislative liaison, and I will read uh, what she said. So, I apologize for, for reading. Uh, the recently passed Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA, contains a five year surface transportation bill that includes additional funding. For many programs that are vital to the county and the Commonwealth, the IIJA authorizes or provides funding for several programs that support local transportation related projects, including a significant increase to the transportation alternatives program and substantial funding for various discretionary grant programs, including a new program that supports local initiatives to prevent death and serious injury on roads and streets. 
while the IIJA has created several competitive grant opportunities over the next several years, Congress is again considering increasing the use of project specific funding mechanisms. As these various opportunities become available, we will be working to advance vital projects in Fairfax County. So that's the uh, written answer that my legislative uh, liaison gave me. Uh, if you have any questions, I can uh, see if I can answer them or uh, more appropriately take them back to uh, her. Howard? Yes, yeah, so yeah. it might not relate to the infrastructure bill, but there was some additional funding that was approved for the I-495 crossings. It was funded, I think it was by the third quarter or the end of year carryover funds. What is the status of that study for the I-495 crossings? Correct. As part of carryover, um, uh, Nicole referenced the active Fairfax transportation plan phase 2. There was a, a numerous, not numerous, a few transportation studies that were also funded by the board. Uh, the, the crossings that you're concerned with at the, the route 50. Uh, Fairview park area of the beltway, uh, a wheelie Avenue, a corridor study. And I believe a gallows uh, corridor study, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. So, uh, since that money was just um, approved, uh, I'm sure no work has started yet. Uh, Nicole and I are ahead of the game because we already had a consultant on board for Active Fairfax. So, I, I don't know the, answer, the direct answer to your question, but I would assume that um, the planning staff is uh, working to procure a consultant, select a consultant, and develop a scope of work. So, I can ask. Um, uh, staff uh, about that and uh, um, try to, I, I can email you a response. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so I do have one funding uh, thing to go over, but I thought I'd uh, bring to the committee's attention uh, two issues that came up uh, or the one that came up and one that's coming up. So um, we had a meeting in um, Mason District with Supervisor Gross and her staff and some trail advocates uh, and uh, James uh, was not able to be in the meeting, but I understand he knows uh, all about this. Uh, and it's a, a very interesting and, and um, intriguing idea called the Annandale Greenway. The idea is linking um, uh, uh, an east west corridor that's uh, semi parallels uh, Little River Turnpike. Um, uh, with existing park lands and existing um, uh, street street connections uh, to connect uh, Annandale to uh, to ultimately the the Beltway, and I'm sorry, is that hidden ponds at the Beltway there? Uh, a park asset at the Beltway there off hidden of Elmer. Oaks. Hidden Oaks. Okay, I know the county. I know the county pretty good. It's, it's a big county. Um, and then ultimately it was brought up in the meeting that uh, you're this you're this close to crossing the beltway and getting over to the cross county trail. So, uh, we had a meeting with uh, supervisor gross uh, uh, pulled us all together had a meeting on that. Um, she'll be doing a board matter uh, asking us to add the Annadale greenway as a branded. Um, 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 trail corridor to the, uh, to the trails plan and again, um. It was a very um, intriguing and positive uh, idea of, of being able to, to uh, tie together existing uh, park assets, VDOT assets, you know, improve crosswalks, things like that. There would certainly be some infrastructure work that would need to be done, but um, uh, I think the spark, spark has been lit, so to speak, and uh, I think that's a, a great um, it was, we, we were all su super enthusiastic about uh, the idea uh, and just, you know, of course, the devil's in the details. You know, you, you don't want to invite families out to go for a walk, uh, you know, until it's in, until we get it, get a crosswalk somewhere and stuff like that. But from a uh, from a, um, a, a branding and a marketing point of view, 
it's just a, a fantastic idea to to brand something like that and, and tie things together. So thought I'd uh, mention that quickly. I see uh, a couple of you. You want to add anything? So, Chris, I think, uh, go ahead. Go back. Go ahead, Jim. Um, so, yeah, um, it's all entirely in the Mason district. Um, something I came up with and found a group of people who are interested in doing it. We've been meeting on a regular basis with the committee of interested citizens. Uh, people have been paying attention to it. Um, I'm very pleased that VDOT and the Park Authority have been super positive about it. I think that's really one of the things I wanted to try to do was create an infrastructure thing that wasn't, you know, two million dollars. It was like it was just an idea and with existing infrastructure um, for the most part, as Chris noted. Um, so I was I was actually going to bring it up at the next meeting, but um, uh, I, and I am very intrigued by it. I, I think I talked to Sean about this at one point. I think the connection to the Cross County Trail is the first of what would be many possible um, ancillary trails. One of the things about this, I'll just say I'll close with this, is it is it's a central element of a community like Annandale, which is kind of disparate and has a little bit less of an identity than some areas that would connect residential areas, both low, middle, and high income with a number of parks in the area giving access. So wayfinding is being very important and also driving traffic along a a trail that would bring people across in front of businesses uh, that are right there. And I think so a lot of these features are the kinds of things that made it um, attractive to get behind. And we haven't had any um, real resistance to the idea, though I know that, you know, that's always in the cards down the road. But I think Beth has come out with me on this and, and on the trail, and that was a really super helpful conversation. If anybody wants to spend two hours talking to Beth, um, I highly recommend it as being a positive thing. As you can say, I have a passion. <laughs> um, the only thing I was going to, just for food for thought, as we kind of talk about this, because it came up on something else. And I haven't been in the trails coordinator, coordinator position here at Park 30 very long. Um, but, you know, we have this branded trail of the CCT. And it's generally thought of as the park authorities. We had a question come up on the West County Trail, and we were like, well, who kind of who kind of owns that? Since it's also a, a braided trail, which we're calling like these on-road, off-road, you know, combo trails. And now we have kind of like this one coming in. I'm assuming we may have more. And so just some food for thought, and I don't have an answer, but you know, in terms of overarching ownership of it you don't want a three-party ownership between vdot fcdot and park authority maybe you do but we kind of need to figure those things out when we start creating these more i'll say regional trails where it's not just local serving a park it's not just serving one community or two communities it's serving a, a district of people and who then would sort of be the overseer of that because i think if you leave it to all three of us it might it might not work out well <laughs> so yeah, that, that's, just food for thought. That's a, that's actually a great point. We we certainly in this meeting, you know, discussed that the that the cross county trail is the, set the precedent for this type of idea. Uh, but you're right. Uh, everyone thinks of the CCT as the park authorities, and it it goes along beat out right away, and so on and so forth. I think we need to start thinking, you know, big picture wise. As this is, this is a county asset, and and VDOT is part of the county, and. And and that's the way it should be. So that's that's really a good point. Let me so, ask yeah. you. About, let me ask you about the cross county trail. Cross county trail. What percent is park authority? Like ballpark must be high. I'll go with high, but I would I would also include portions that are on private land that are having trail easement. So if you do that, it's probably higher. If you take off of those pieces. We still have the majority. We still have the majority, so um, we could do it as majority vote. But you know, I'm not sure if we want to leave VDOT in charge of our county trails. You know, that sort of thing. It, it just something to think about and how we're how we're going to tackle these things from a branding yeah, and, standpoint and, and and that sort of thing because everyone has different control pieces, especially with this one. So, well, that's right. It's also who you're going to call when there's a problem, right? And certainly from the Department of Transportation's. Uh, 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 perspective, um, I have been educated that the um, natural surface trail network is actually a feeder network to our transportation network and is actually 
um, a big part of what people are looking to to, to uh, enjoy in, in our county. So uh, we in the past we've always been like, well, you know, there's recreational trails in the parks. That's the parks, but where does a recreational trail fall that's not in the parks? And the answer in the past was. There wasn't an agency that represented that. I think it's fair to say now that um, our agency represents that. It, it's going to fall within the active uh, Fairfax transportation plan, and and uh, that doesn't <laughs> mean all of our problems are solved. But uh, I, I think Beth makes a really good point there. So, uh, in the interest of time, I know we have some uh, visitors tonight. We want to get uh, to their time, and uh, we're probably going to run a few minutes past eight thirty. The other thing I wanted to make the group aware of is um, West Falls Church uh, Metro area. So uh, you may be aware that uh, Metro and UVA, Virginia Tech, whoever owns all that land there, uh, proposed uh, a transit oriented development area around the, the Metro station there. Um, there was a, 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 zone, a, a zoning, um, not a zoning, a comprehensive plan um uh, uh workflow i think it was i don't know what we call them these days a plan amendment something like that uh that had a task force associated with it and the absolute biggest concern expressed by the local community was uh pedestrian safety and pedestrian access and you know, that um this development would uh increase the need uh, or the desire for people to uh, to walk to this development if there's you know more there than just a metro station. So there's a, a meeting coming up Monday night, uh, December 13th at 7 p.m. It's the first meeting of a of a, a advisory group uh, for the West Falls Church uh, Active Transportation Gap Analysis, as it's called. I, I'm going as staff. It's actually being led by our uh, our planning group because they are the ones that were involved in this comprehensive plan uh, group. Uh, it's um, it overlaps both Drainsville and Providence districts, so I'm I'm uh, sure both uh, Drainsville and Providence uh, uh, Board of Supervisors office have already um, assigned um, citizens to be on this advisory group. But it's the kind of effort that the trails committee uh, certainly wants to be aware of. Um, and so, again, the meeting is Monday night um, at 7 p.m. I assume it's public. Um, it's on WebEx meeting like this. Uh, and as this uh, um, continues, the, this work continues, uh, the ultimate game uh, plan would be for the community to give us input about what what are the priorities, uh, be it um, missing uh, infrastructure or uh, inadequate infrastructure that needs improving, uh, so on and so forth. So that's actually an excellent segue to something that the committee is definitely gonna be interested in. And that's that the Board of Supervisors did a board matter on October 5th, uh, expressing their frustration with the lack of funding for pedestrian and bicycle projects. Um, the uh, official answer right now from the Department of Transportation is that all of our current funding is encumbered on existing projects through FY 2026 or later. Uh, in 2019, we uh, updated the transportation priorities plan and deferred projects uh, that we did not have money to uh, work on uh, through FY 2025. So, uh, if we are to dust off those deferred projects in, uh, 2026 and start working on them, <coughs> we would need, uh, the available funding, uh, moving forward past, uh, 2026 and, and they're not all ped bike projects. Some of those are road projects. So the board in a joint mo board matter that included <coughs> every single, board, every single board member. Uh, except Supervisor Harity, and then when Supervisor Harity uh, was was listening to the board matter, he acknowledged that he he, he would have supported it also. So it's pretty, fairly unique that we have a board matter that comes from the entire board. Um, they ask uh, basically three things: that the county executive and staff find money uh, beginning this fiscal year in fiscal year twenty two. 
uh, for pedestrian bicycle projects with the ultimate goal uh, over six fiscal years of something in the range of $100 million uh, for pedestrian bicycle projects. The second thing that they ask is that staff return with uh, a list of uh, the unfunded projects uh, that we know about that would be uh, good candidate projects uh, to be considered for funding. And then the third thing they ask for is uh, that staff return with um, uh, proposed criteria for evaluating um, the, the unfunded projects that, that we have. So uh, Nicole and I and Lauren have been working uh, very hard in the past few weeks to uh, uh, answer our part of those questions, which is the lists of projects and the funding, the criteria for evaluating them. Uh, we are um, scheduled to go to the Board Transportation Committee on December 14th uh, to present um, the uh, response to this board matter. Uh, separately, our, our coordination and funding folks are uh, uh, working with the, um, the county's uh, uh, budget folks. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know their official name, but the, the, the folks that prepare the county county's entire budget, uh, the budget agency, uh, to try and answer this uh, request of the county executive to uh, find some money. It, it, what I'm hearing from my director is um, there appears to be um, some opportunities. Of this The timing of the original board matter was when the board approves, approved carryover. Uh, carryover, if you don't know, is a reconciliation of the proposed budget with what actually happened. So, you know, we propose a $7 billion budget every year, half of it goes to schools. Uh, but in the, um, as the year plays out, you know, things don't happen, things do happen. Uh, uh, typically, we run a surplus that we do, that there is some leftover money. And when in these years, when there is some leftover money, uh, that's called the carryover package. This year it was a couple hundred million dollars. So the board's point was, well, if you, if you have this carryover money, we'd like to see some of it go to a pedestrian bicycle project. So uh, my director is indicating that a uh, budget thinks that there might be something in the ballpark of $20 million uh, this fiscal year. And, you know, that would, um, uh, Probably be the, the the ballpark uh, in each fiscal year moving forward. So we've compiled uh, again. I'm not the I'm not we're not the budget people. We'll let the budget people come up with the dollar amount. We're the we're the pedestrian bicycle people. So we've come up. Uh, we we're presenting. Uh, I'll be doing the presentation. We have um, unfortunately uh, the needs far outweigh. Uh, this effort at funding. So we have hundreds, if not thousands of uh, potential projects for consideration. So a key part of this is the, uh, the proposed criteria. Uh, luckily, because of the active Fairfax uh, transportation plan, we were already developing uh, uh, transportation funding uh, criteria um, for the board's consideration for any and all future uh, funding opportunities. So we have, um, of course, uh, important data on uh, equity needs, uh, travel demand, uh, tra uh, um, active, active transportation demand, <clears throat> safety, so on and so forth. So uh, we're presenting that. The list of projects we have are uh, too numerous, <laughs> unfortunately, to, to summarize, but they are. The, the projects that were deferred in that TPP deferred. We have projects that have come out of previous studies, VDOT studies, county studies. We have uh, project, uh, we, we have a, a gap analysis and, and uh, crosswalk request uh, projects. We have uh, the board also ask about maintenance. And so our maintenance people have given us potential maintenance projects to consider. Uh, we have this running list of projects that we call the unfunded uh, list where citizens have made requests. We have the input from the um, active Fairfax 
uh, transportation plan outreach where we had the interactive maps that I'm sure you're familiar with where people listed barriers. So those last two, the unfunded project requests and the, uh, the, the barrier list, that's what we call raw data that hasn't been reviewed yet by staff, but we're presenting all this information to the board, <coughs> excuse me, just so that they are aware of the magnitude of the issues, but the, um, the uh, evaluation criteria is proposed to be a four step process that uh, by using GIS and, and, and uh, being able to, um, uh, you know, sort of put everything in, in a blender. Um, you can come up with, okay, these, these projects are in high demand areas, high, high equity need areas. Uh, and then we will have, of course, board board community input, such as, as you all, the trails committee. Uh, and then ultimately develop a short list. And this would probably, in, in my prediction, will happen uh, regularly. The board, the board legally cannot uh, approve funding beyond uh, the current fiscal year or uh, the upcoming fiscal 23 budget. So the board cannot legally you know, say that in 24 or 25 or 26, there'll be this amount of dollars. So I assume that this will be a, an annual uh, exercise uh, for this type of money. So uh, I know we're running late on time. I just thought I'd uh, uh, make you all aware of that. Again, you can you can um, look, you can uh, look up the it was the board meeting of October 5th. If you'd like to see the board discussion on it, you can uh, review the video. And again, this coming. Um, uh, next next week on uh, December 14th, uh, we will be at the board transportation committee uh, discussing the staff response to all of this. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. Um, would it be too much to ask for you to send us your presentation to the board to this committee? Uh, after the board, but at the uh, board, yes, we're at the board. So, so correct. We, yes, no. Not yes. Yeah, we want to approve it before now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. After the board. No, thank you very much. No problem. Uh, so. Uh, my apologies to the members of the public. Um, so let's uh, let's, uh, but we will move to you now. So um, uh, let's see, Nicole. Do you have uh, you have visibility of the list, and why don't you go ahead and release them one at a time? Sure. And first, um, Jim asked me to share a map. Uh, it will take me a minute to pull it up, and I have to unshare my current screen to do so. So let me. Stop sharing and open it up for discussion. And in the meantime, I will pull the map up. So, um, let's see. So, uh, should we actually, Philip wanted to give a presentation. Should we start with that? So, we have a. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's okay. All right. Before I pull up the map, let's, let's get well, Philip um, up here. So, Philip, I will make you a. Um, panelist for your presentation, so you will be able to share your screen in a few seconds. Okay, well, uh, well, we're waiting. Let me uh, just mention on the uh, topic of the cinder bed road bikeway that uh, the currently proposed route is only a direct route. We heard that word many times. If you uh, start from an arbitrary starting point, if you change the starting point, then the uh, existing routes are uh, are more direct. I also need to point out for, uh, for the, in this case, and, and just in general, we do not have enough forests and streams left to form an alternate transportation network. So we really have to, uh, if we're going to get put in a, an improved non motorized transportation network, we have to do it with the streets Forests uh, just aren't, aren't there to, uh, to provide the space for. Them. Would you also like to share a presentation? Or yes, uh, how, do, how do I do that? Okay, so so I made you a panelist, uh, so you will be able to, at the bottom of your screen, sh you should see a share button. You would need to click so, on that and then select your presentation. Seems to be grayed out. Oh, okay. Let's see if I need to give you a special permission. Otherwise, you can also email it to me and I can pull it up for you if you don't have the permission. Let's see if there's a setting I can change. Oh, I have to make you presenter. Yes, one second. Okay. 
Hey, uh, in the uh, interest of uh, not taking up too much of the committee's valuable time, I, I brought you the three minute uh, version of the uh, video. However, given, uh, given the interest shown in the topic, I could give you the uh, 10 minute version. You should be able to share now. I just want to point out, Philip, we did have a presentation a couple of months ago, a 25 minute presentation. From me? No, from the friends of the uh, of um, of Akaton Creek. Really? Okay. I'm getting. Uh, I must be getting confused in my uh, presentations then. Well. Uh... Are, are you seeing the screen now? Not yet. Um, Not you yet. need to see a red uh, frame around your um, screen. So you can either share the document directly um, after you hit the share button, you would need to select the document. Oh, yeah, now it's changing. Now okay, we see. Well, this, is, this is not the video, but this is the PowerPoint version, but this should work as well. Just let it play and it can speak for itself. Sweet. Are you sharing sound with that? Yes, I am. So we don't hear the sound. Uh. So you may have to present verbally. What else do I have to do here to make that happen? That can be a little bit more tricky. Well, sure. the sound just... isn't really anything. It's just background music too long. I'll let you know the thing hasn't frozen. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Is it frozen?
that uh, concludes the presentation. Okay, thank you. Next presenter, please. All right, let me. Um, uh, can you uh, stop sharing your screen? And scroll down to the happened here. So let me add you back to um, attendee list. Sorry, first time doing this here. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry to the uh, screen I had before that showed the share button. It's gone. Yes. That's so, um, yeah, you're no, no longer the presenter. So, okay. um, do you have any other uh, other comments before we move on to the next one? Oh, I guess uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Thank you. If you can mute yourself and then uh, I will unmute the next person. Um, who would like to speak? Um, you have. I think it was, go ahead. I think April said she had a question. Okay. I just want to mention that you can raise your hand. There's a raise your hand button. Um, I'm not sure where it is on your screen since I'm in a different, uh, I have a different view, but if you look at options, maybe there's a little button to raise your hand and then I know to un uh, that you would like to speak and then I can unmute you. But let's start with Avril. Okay, I put my questions in the chat. Can you see them? Uh, yes, would you like me to read them or would you? Yes, uh, you can read them. Thanks. Okay. Let me look for the chat. Um, I think you place in the Q&A. Here we go. So, so the first question is, um, given the ongoing loss of trees to development and the fact that trees are our best carbon sinks and the lack of data of how many cars the bikeway would take off the roads, how would building this bikeway help the county achieve its CECAP goals? Now, if Chris would like to take this question. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? It cut out in the middle. Sorry, given the ongoing loss of trees to development and the fact that trees are our best carbon sinks and the lack of data of how many cars the bikeway would take off the roads, how would building this bikeway help the county achieve its CECAP goals? Uh, I I don't know what CECP uh, stands for. Um, I mean, again, the, the project is more commonly known as CCAP. More commonly known as CCAP, the uh, Climate uh, Change Goals. Sure. So th that's the juxtaposition of this project, right? You know, uh, getting people out of their cars and <laughs> walking or biking uh, is absolutely. Uh, uh, universally understood as um, things that we need to do for climate change. However, uh, acknowledging that this is a route through through a forest, um, that that is, um, you know, deforestation is a worldwide problem. So, um, you know, I, I certainly can't speak to, um, you know, the amount of deforestation around the world and in our county that is caused, you know, by development um, or other activities. This trail is intended to get people out of cars. So, unlike building townhouses or uh, something else, um, there is a climate benefit to a trail. But I, I certainly cannot quantify um, the trade-off between the 
the trees and the it, getting people out of cars. Thank you, Chris. Um, Etsy posted in the chat. Uh, that you would also like to um, ask a question. So, Avril, since you had several questions, if you don't mind, we're going to bounce forth and back between um, um, the, the questions so we can get to everyone. So, let me okay. unmute um, Betsy. You're unmuted. Okay. Um. I just wanted to say I was gratified to hear some of the members of the committee expressing their concerns about this magnolia bog in this very sensitive environmental area. And also the um, comment that was uh, made about <laughs> learning how to take space away from the cars instead of uh, occupying the natural areas that we have remaining to us. Um, so I'm hopeful that um, that the environmental concerns that we've been raising, that you all, that they also resonate with you all and that you perhaps even share some of the, some of them and want to make your trails be um, more environmentally friendly than I think this one will be. And I wanted to comment that I think the whole process by which these trails get approved doesn't seem to have enough uh, environmental review built into it. So I was glad to hear that Stormwater is talking to the Park Authority about where you're going to put the trails. That seems like a very positive sign. I just wanted to say, um, I think uh, it's really important to keep a separation between the trails that are meant to bring people into nature and, and that really are sort of recreational trails and that there, it makes sense to have some of them going through stream valleys. But this trail is about transportation. This is about getting from point A to point B. And it doesn't even seem to quite follow the law. You know, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation um, Ordinance uh, has an exemption for passive recreation trails. And it also has an exemption for public roads. But the exemption for public roads says that it's conditioned on optimizing the road alignment and to prevent or otherwise minimize encroachment in the resource protection area and avoid um, adverse impacts on water quality. So I think that the county and perhaps your committee really need to sort of find a way to be much more environmentally sensitive about where you're putting these trails and what the impacts are going to be. So thank you for um, allowing us to speak. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, let me pull up the map. I was clicking through the um, maps that Jim Klein uh, shared with me in the chat uh, to find the best one. Um, let me share what I found. So we have a, an image to look at. Um, let's see. Let's see if this is the correct one. There you go. Is that the area where the 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 most of the concerns are, or is that further north or south? That's it. That's it. That's one of the crossings. That red area is one of the crossings. Right. Okay, great. I just want us to have an image to look at while we have this discussion. Go back to. I, I think the bog is actually uh, past the bridge to the north. Okay, I can pull up um, the one next to it. Can I just make a okay. general comment while we're bringing this up? <clears throat> which is that while this specific trail may overly encroach on natural land at the expense of or in, pay, in the support of transportation, there are many other locations in the county where a trail of this sort is both useful and the environmentally sound thing to do. 
The Cross County Trail is a fantastic example of that, where in addition to providing a transportation network and recreation network, it also provides a <clears throat> fantastic way for people to see the natural resource that they know needs protecting. The amount of tree loss from a linear trail is minimal when you compare it to the amount of tree loss from trans, uh, transferring existing forested land to housing or other development. So the trails are really not the problem when it comes to deforestation. In addition, because they are intended as a way to remove cars from the road, linear trails that do provide a transportation network, in addition to having a limited impact on the number of trees, have a positive impact the other direction by removing vehicles from the roads. So I just wanted to clarify that uh, for everyone. Well, you're, you're limiting this to the impact on trees, which is important. But when you're going through a wetland and building within it, like you are here and clearing and compacting the soils, you're having other effects too. You know, you're um, changing the hydrology, you're um, creating a corridor through which invasive species can invade the whole area and degrade it. So you're having a lot of impacts. It's not just about the trees, although of course that's important. It must also be noted that so many of these other impacts, though they be greater, are very, very difficult to avoid because they're on private property and we can't just take the private property away. They're on major roads and we can't just say the major road can never be widened. But these, uh, these trails through the forests are entirely optional in every case, almost every case at least. There are options on the streets and we can save that little bit of forest. Just to clarify, optional because of car dominance. Optional because of the choice by the county and the nation and the area to be dominated by cars as opposed to other forms of transportation. Well, we're with you there. It would be nice to reduce the dominance by cars. All right, um, we have a couple more questions in the chat um, that I can read um, that were submitted by April Garland. So the second question, do we have the time? Not really. Okay, would you, would you rather, okay, I'm, I leave it to let, let me know what you want to do. <laughs> well, we've given uh, in a half hour for public comments. So, okay. so, um, uh, and, um, uh, Quite honestly, part of it was a repeat of the presentation that was given three months ago. So, um, I, I, I think it's appropriate to be respectful of the members' time who've uh, devoted already two hours to this. So, um, I think uh, we're out of time, folks. So, um, I move to adjourn. I second that. Okay, so the meeting is finished. It is now 9 o'clock p.m. and we will see everybody next month. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everyone and the public members as well. <laughs>